I want to talk to you today about why I believe in Easter. And as you take out your sermon notes uh, in your welcome guide, if you guys will pull those out, I have some notes there to take with you to follow along with me, and you can take those home and, and take good notes. I want to say happy Easter to each one of you. So glad that you guys are here and that you decided to join us for Easter. I know you could be a lot of places today, and you chose to be with us, and we're so happy to have you here um, now, listen, while you're here, there's going to be a lot of guests here that are just like you today, okay? So if someone's rude to you, they're a guest, all right? And uh, in all seriousness, we are thrilled to have you guys here. So welcome, welcome, welcome. My prayer is, is as I share with you about why I believe in Easter, that God will challenge your faith and that you will learn to love the same Jesus Christ that I have learned to love in my life. If you have your Bibles or your message notes, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 17 through 20 as we stand in the honor of God's Word. And today I'm reading from the New Living Translation here for a moment. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. And you are still under condemnation for your sins. In that case, all who have died for believing in Christ, they've perished. And if we hope in Christ only for this life, we are the most miserable people in the world. But the fact is, Christ has been raised from the dead. The word of the Lord, and you may be seated. Everything that we as Christians believe in, believing in the book, believing in God, believing in sharing about Jesus, believing in prayer, believing in studying the Bible, believing that this is more than just a book of antiquity, but it's actually, as Christians, we believe it's, it's the, the Word of God. Everything that we believe in as Christians is based upon the foundation and the reality of Jesus Christ's resurrection. Listen carefully. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation of our belief. And if Jesus Christ was not risen from the dead, then everything that we believe in as Christians is loose, useless. If Jesus Christ has not been risen from the dead, this is not God's word. It's just a book. If Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead, then all of the prayers we've prayed and are useless. If Jesus Christ has not been risen from the dead, gathering here on this Sunday morning or every other Sunday or serving, teaching the children or teaching the teens or leading people in the worship of song, my life of traveling the world and proclaiming the gospel message if Jesus has not been risen from the dead, my life has been a waste. And I've wasted my life. You see, without the resurrection, there is no salvation. Without the resurrection, there is no hope. Without the resurrection, there is no peace. Without the resurrection, there is no future. And if the resurrection did not happen, if it was a hoax perpetuated by these guys in some kind of grand conspiracy theory, if it's just a hoax, then I challenge you today when you leave this building, never come back again. If it's a hoax, I, I challenge you to never pray another prayer again. If it's a hoax, I, I challenge you to take this life and Grab a hold of this one life as tightly as you can and squeeze as much out of it as you can. If the resurrection didn't happen, if, if Easter isn't true, then I challenge you to throw out your morality and throw out your ethics. And I encourage you to live for yourself. 
I encourage you to make yourself your own God and to use people and use them up. If Easter really didn't happen, I, I challenge you to be mean and to be cruel and to don't care about the consequences. I encourage you to not worry about other people's feelings or your children or your wife, but, but I challenge you to work as hard as you can, to make as much money as you can, to build the biggest houses that you can, that you're so busy working for that you never end. If the resurrection and Easter didn't happen, I challenge you to never again squirm when you're at work and someone swears and takes the name of Jesus in vain. But you guys know that I come from a different place. I believe that Easter is true. And I believe many of you do too. I believe that the resurrection really did happen. And I want to give you seven logical reasons why I believe that the resurrection has happened. But before I do that, I want to remind you of the great commandment. When Jesus Christ was asked, they said, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, I'll give you two. He said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And then he said, and love the Lord your God with all of your mind. And then he said, the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. I want to submit to you today that when you love God, it's more than just loving God from the heart. Your faith in Easter, your faith in the resurrection is more than just some emotional feeling that you get because that's what mama told you when you were a little tyke. Jesus said, I want you to love me with all of your heart and with all of your mind. And so having faith in Jesus, having faith in the resurrection, my friends, isn't this, this, this blind leap. It's a logical faith. Christianity is a logical belief. Christianity is something that we do with both our heart and our mind. And listen, Christianity, my friends, doesn't require you to check your brain at the door. I'm not asking you to be a sheeple. I'm not asking you not to think. I am not basing my entire life, changing the entire trajectory of this one life I've been given because I just feel it's true. Oh, yes, it brings up many feelings. And today, as, as you were worshiping the song, some of you were in tears, and some of you were smiling and laughing, and some of you just had this sense of peace that comes over you. And I'm so thankful for the emotional side of it. I, I'm so thankful for that side of it. But my friend, it's also a logical argument to it. So let me give you seven reasons why I believe in the resurrection very quickly today. And listen, uh, those that are visiting with us, if you say yes or amen, I cut about two minutes off my message for every amen I get. So right now, we're, we're, we're tracking a two-hour message, all right? That's where we're at right now. Do I get an amen? amen. All right, we, we've, we've cut it down about half, all right? The first reason is this. Number one, I believe in Easter because the first Christians talked about the resurrection Immediately. Think about that for a moment. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, it's on the screen. It says, And when the day of Pentecost came, Peter stood up before about several thousands of people. And he stood up, he raised his voice, and he addressed the crowd, and he says, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Now, now why is it important to me that the first Christians talked about the resurrection immediately? Now, they began within a few days to talk about it, but this sermon before thousands of people was only 50 days after the resurrection. And why is that important? Because if you're going to have a hoax, if you're going to have a conspiracy, if you're going to try to lie about something as great as the resurrection, what you need is you need a lot of space between the event and before you tell it. Because we know if we can get some space involved there, then memories become 
fuzzy. And the temperature comes down just a little bit. And then you have less chance of rebuttal or someone arguing with you or someone denying that it happened. But look what these disciples did. They did not give it a lot of space, but immediately they began to talk about the resurrection. I find that something to consider. Number two, here's a second reason why I believe in Easter and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because the first Christians talked about the resurrection where it happened. Listen to these words, Acts chapter 2. Then Peter shouted to the crowd. He says, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Look at the person next to you and say, Jerusalem. He said, make no mistake about this. God publicly endorsed Jesus of Nazareth by doing wonderful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But you followed God's prearranged plan, and with the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross, and you murdered him. However, God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life again, for death could not keep him in its grip. I've been privileged to travel to 48 states. I have traveled, I don't know, over 20 nations. And I've been privileged to meet people in all kinds of different walks of life. But one thing that's happened is, as I've done that, you know what you begin to hear a lot of? You begin to hear a lot of urban legends and urban myths. And so you're in southeastern Oklahoma, and you hear this urban legend, this urban myth about some boogeyman in the woods. And then you travel over into Colorado, and you're in the Rocky Mountain wilderness, and someone there from Pennsylvania tells you the exact same story that happened in their woods near Scranton, Pennsylvania. And then you go over to Rome, and you're standing in Rome, and you're having a slice with someone, and you hear a story about what happens near Lake Como, and it's the same story. But here is how it usually begins. I have a friend of a friend who told me this story, and here's where it's happened. You know what? One of the best things that the first Christians could have done about the resurrection, they should have taken their story and they should have traveled a thousand miles away and told it there. And said, back at Jerusalem, Jesus was risen from the dead because those people a thousand miles away could not investigate it. Those people a thousand miles away could not check the evidence. Those people a thousand miles away couldn't say, you're a bunch of liars. And that's how some of these hoaxes began. We move them far away from us so that they cannot be disputed. But listen, in Jerusalem, where Jesus Christ was publicly crucified, where Jesus rose from the dead, it was in that very city, within a short period of time, the disciples said, in this very city, the man that you crucified has been risen from the dead. Now, if I was going to do a hoax, I would have traveled a thousand miles away and would have started it there so that you couldn't argue with me or refute me. That's my second reason for believing the resurrection. Listen to what a smarter guy than I said. Dr. William Lane Craig put it this way. He said, quote, one of the most amazing facts about early Christian belief in Jesus' resurrection was that it originated in the very city where Jesus was crucified. The Christian faith did not come to exist in some distant city, far away from eyewitnesses who know of Jesus' death and burial. No, it came into being in the very city where Jesus had been publicly crucified under the very eyes of its enemies. End quote. Number three, here is why I believe in Easter. Logical, not just from the heart, but logical. The disciples did not keep the location of the tomb a secret. Think about that for a moment. In John chapter 19 and verse 41, it says, 
And at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in that garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. They gave the city, they gave the state, they gave the zip to where anyone could go back and search out that place where he was buried. And why is this important to me? Why does does this help me in my faith? Because it encouraged investigation. Can I tell you as a believer in Christ, your questions don't worry me? Can I tell you as a believer in Christ that your doubts don't worry me? In fact, as a believer in Christ, I say open up the windows, open up the doors, and ask the questions. Ask the questions. They were saying, hey, I want you to have an investigation. I invite you to to go ahead and, and go down to the very place where we said he was risen from the dead. And I want you to talk to the Roman soldiers. And if we would have bribed the Roman soldiers, they would have died for letting him escape. I want you to go and investigate it. Is this true? Did this happen? Bring your questions. That's my third reason why I logically believe in Easter. Number four, and this is a big one for me because I am the middle child of three redneck brothers, all right? Redneck number one, I'm the redneck number two, and my baby brother is redneck number three. Why do I believe in the resurrection? Because Jesus Christ's own brothers believed he was God. It wasn't always that case. I want you to look at it for just a moment. Look at John chapter 7 and verse 5. While Jesus was living, it says, For not even his brothers... Believed in him. Could you imagine being raised up with Jesus and his mama is praying to him? Just be like Jesus, boys. Act like Jesus. Be a good boy like Jesus. Could you imagine being one of his brothers and you hit your thumb with a hammer and you want to say, Sorry, Jesus Christ. At first, they they didn't believe in him. At first, they didn't believe in the Messiah. But here's what's amazing to me. His younger brother, James, became a leader in the church. Brother James didn't believe in him at first, but he became a leader in the church. And he wrote in our Bible, the book of James. But here's what happened in AD 62. They threw James off of the temple building. And when they landed on the ground, others came and they beat him with clubs until he died. See, this brother who didn't even believe in him at first became this prayer warrior. And they called him Camel Knees because he prayed so long that his kneecaps had calluses on him because he prayed so much. Last summer, I did a series through the book of Jude, Judas, Judah was another brother of Jesus who who came to believe in Jesus Christ and he gave us that short little book, the book of Jude. But I want to ask you a question. What happened between Jesus Christ's life and his death? What happened after that that would cause his brothers To believe he was God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 4 and 7. And it says. And that he was buried. And that he was raised. On the third day. According to the scriptures. And then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles. Let me ask you this question. What would it take for you to believe. That your own sibling was God. Think about it. What would it take for you to believe that your baby brother was God? What would it take for you to believe that your sister was God? What would it take for you to believe that your older brother was God? James and Judah and his sisters and his brothers did not believe he was God. Something happened. And the author of Corinthians just tells us, That after his resurrection, 
Jesus appeared to his brother. He appeared to James. What takes an unbeliever in your brother that he is God and makes you a believer in him so much that you are willing to die for your faith and be thrown off a high place and be clubbed? I'll tell you what it is. In order for me to believe that my brother was God, he would have to rise from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. Think about your brothers. Think about your siblings. They know everything about you. They know every detail about you. When I was traveling across country, I would I'd speak in all kinds of churches all across America, and uh, I didn't have to do my laundry because I would take it to a service or someone in the church would clean it for me. And I would, I would come home and I would walk in and mom would hug me. And then she'd look at me and she'd say, boy, you are no prince around here. You're just my son. You can do your own laundry. I'm not the cleaning service. You can make your own bed. I'm not your maid. I love you, boy. But listen, you're just my boy around here. What would it take for you to believe a family member was God? Logically, something drastic would have to happen. Number five, we got, seven, we got two more to go. Number five, why do I believe in Easter? Well, it's the quality of the witnesses. Now, as I mentioned earlier, all of these urban myths and all of these rumors start like this. I know a guy who said, and you say, well, what's his name? Well, I really don't know the guy. I know a guy that knows a guy that knows a guy. But when I talk, we talk about the resurrection, when I, when I read this ancient text, you know what I find? I find that it names 16 people, at least 16 people by name who were witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 16 Eyewitnesses by name. Think about that for a moment. One of those witnesses was a guy by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. Now to list Joseph of Arimathea as one of your witnesses, you are committing a hoax suicide if you are to mention his name. If it's not true. Because Joseph of Arimathea was the man who took Jesus Christ's body off the cross and he buried him in a tomb that had never been used before. Well, why do I mention Joseph of Arimathea before you? Because Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the Supreme Court of Israel. To say that a chief justice took down the body of Jesus and put him in a tomb and then quote him as a witness of that event and to quote him as if and to say, hey, I'm going to name you Joseph of Arimathea. He could have easily disputed the fact and say this did not happen. Next, I want to talk to you about the, the testimony of the women. Listen carefully. The Bible talks about how that it was women that came to the tomb. And it was women that said, he is not here, he is risen. It was women that went down there. They did not have the ability to remove the stone by themselves. But when they arrived there, they talk about how that Jesus Christ is risen. And why is that important to me? It's important because of this. In the time of Jesus, in the, in the time of this account, do you realize that a woman could not testify in the court of law. Why? Because at that time, women were considered to be dishonest and liars. They were not considered to be trustworthy witnesses. But the Bible tells us who found Jesus' empty tomb. Women. And who includes their story in the account? The Bible. Wow. So all this argument, first of all, that, that God and the church and the Bible doesn't value women. First of all, it is the Bible that quotes it were women as the first witnesses and valued what they said. Wow, you ladies should have taken an amen to that one. 
And, and why is this important to me? Be, because if they were lying about this, if, if it were a hoax, and they wanted to get the momentum and the traction that they needed, do you think that they would have risked having women tell the story if it wasn't true? Why take that risk if you live in a culture that doesn't value women? Why take that risk if you live in a culture of the time that thought they were old liars? Why would you allow them to tell the story and include their story in the Bible? Because it was true. Because it happened. Let me give you one more example of these quality of witnesses. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 again, verses 4 through 8. It says that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. And after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and the sisters at the same time. Look at your neighbor and say 500 at the same time. And then he says this, he goes, Dr. Luke writes and says, and most of them are still living, though some have fallen asleep, though, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me. Why is this important to me? Guys, this did not happen just secret. This was not some hallucination where Peter saw him and Mary saw him and the other Mary saw him and Thomas saw him. It wasn't just these private hallucinations when they were in a moment of stress that they made things up. No, he talks about five hundred men and women who at the same time in the same place watch Jesus Christ, the resurrected one, walk into the room. And why is that so powerful? Well, of course, it's the numbers. Of course, it's the quality of the witnesses. But look at this claim. He says, and most of them are still living. Of these 500, most of them are still alive. What is he saying? He's saying, if you don't believe Dr. Luke, if you don't believe Peter, James, and John, there are 500 others who are still alive. I invite you to go track them down. I invite you to go and talk to them. I invite you to go and look at them and say, hey, tell me your story. I invite you to investigate it and punch holes into it and look into it. Don't just take my word for it, but go ask these 500. Logical witnesses. In our culture, you can be convicted for speeding by a camera. Am I right? I am right. I know these things. I have tickets in 12 states, all paid for. You now know my sin and why I need a savior. I mean, it doesn't even take one witness to convict me of speeding. Just a radar gun. Just a camera. In fact, now you can get a red light cam and you get convicted for not even driving. Right? And you tell the judge, I wasn't driving, who was? And you know you don't tell on mama, you don't tell on your wife, you just pay the fine, okay? That's how you stay married, I just pay the fine, judge. He says, go check out the story. 500 others saw him, asked them, investigate. And if you take nothing from this, I want to say to you, my friends, I want to say to you, believer, listen, don't be afraid when people ask questions about your faith. Your faith is not an emotional faith. It is a defendable, logical faith. And I invite you, if, if you're searching and you're looking and you have doubts, I want to say to you, I welcome your doubts. I welcome your questions. If you are truly seeking, if you are truly asking, if you are truly looking for answers, I believe you'll find those answers. Number six, why do I believe in Easter? Because the co-conspirators didn't make themselves look good. 
Look at Luke chapter 24 and verse 11. But they did not believe the woman because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Now at first, they didn't believe him. Now I told you earlier, they later believed them and they included their account. But at first, they, we don't believe these ladies, they're lying. It wasn't like they said, yes, it dawned on me and I have believed. No, it shows their doubts. It shows their questions. And that's the beautiful thing about the scriptures. The scripture shows you people with their doubts and their struggles and their flaws and their warts and their shortcomings. It shows it all. It's not like the legends of, of, of the Greek gods. It's, it's not like the legends of Rome where they are perfect. It shows them warts and all. Look at John chapter 20 and verse 25, speaking of Thomas. And it said, when the other disciples said to Thomas that they had seen the Lord, he declared, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, unless I put my finger where the nails were and put my hands in his side, I will not believe it. Why is that important to me? Because it adds credibility. It shows you that they doubted. It shows you that they didn't walk into this thing and just believe from the start, but they had questions and they looked at it and said, can this be? This has never happened before. And they didn't even believe the women at first. And then Thomas says, I won't believe your stories. It wasn't like it was a cult of personality and Peter said it, so I believe it and that's it. No, Thomas says, unless I touch him, unless I see him with my own eyes, unless I investigate, unless my hands go into his hands, unless my hand goes into his side, unless I see him, I will not believe. Wow. They didn't make themselves look good. They didn't make themselves to be these superheroes. It, it shows their doubts. It shows their fears. It shows their concerns. It, it shows their shortcomings. And here's the reality. Have you ever watched a court case or been in a court case and they bring up the witness? Who do you believe on that witness stand? Someone that admits their faults and admits their vulnerability and admits that they have messed something up and they tell the story? Or someone who comes across like they know everything about anything and everything? Don't you start looking at them and think, they're not credible? Why? Because we've been taught, if it looks too good to be true, it usually is. And when we hear the story of the resurrection, it's messy. It has doubters. It has questioners in it. And it adds credibility when I see Thomas saying, I don't believe. It adds credibility that when in that culture that these disciples did not at first say, oh yeah, we believe the ladies. No, it shows their bias. It shows their their investigating into it. It shows that in their culture that they did not trust women at first. It shows that. It shows them going and looking into it. And then saying, you know what? These ladies did see it. And we saw it too. And finally, number seven. We showed the video earlier. Why do I believe in Easter? Why do I believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Because nobody dies for, and catch that word, a known lie. Now, as soon as I say that, here is what happens. Many of your minds go to another country in the world, and your mind goes to religious fanatics somewhere else who every day are blowing things up in suicide or some other action, killing people for their false beliefs or their false religions. And yes, I submit to you, people die all the time for wrong beliefs. People die all the time for their beliefs. But the disciples were in an entirely different place in history. Follow me here. The disciples were at a place in history where they were the ones at the beginning of the event 
They were at a unique place where they could tell you whether they knew it was a truth or whether it was a hoax. They were at a unique place in history as they told the story, and so they knew the truth. Listen to these words from Lee Strobel in his book, The Case for Christ, quote, he says, people will die for their religious beliefs if they sincerely believe they're true. But people won't die for their religious beliefs if they know their beliefs to be false. While most people can only have faith that their beliefs are true, the disciples were in a position to know without a doubt whether or not Jesus had risen from the dead. They claim they saw him. They claim they talked with him. They claim they ate with him. And if they weren't absolutely certain, they wouldn't have allowed themselves to be tortured to death for proclaiming that the resurrection had happened. Listen carefully. I don't want to be graphic. It's Easter and I want to keep this rated G. But some of the deaths that these disciples went through for proclaiming the resurrection were horrendous. We know that Jesus Christ was crucified and it was a death of vicious cruelty created by the Romans to, to maximize pain. Jesus was crucified. We know that Peter was also crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to be crucified upon an upright cross. One of the disciples who would not recant Jesus, one of the twelve, they literally skinned him alive and peeled his body like an orange of every piece of skin on his body. Why would you go through that? Because he knew there was a resurrection from the dead and he was going to experience that resurrection. Others were stoned. Others beheaded. Some were put, rated G, Roger, I know, but you got to hear this. Some were put into the belly of an animal that was living and then sewn up and they were in the belly of a living animal until that animal died and they died. Brutally murdered. Called to recant their testimony. Called to deny Jesus Christ. But what causes someone to go through a death and lose their life? But more than that, let's go a step further. Because some of you aren't afraid of death. You say, I will die for it because i got a lot of patriots here. And you've taken a vow and you would die for your nation. And, and you're brave and you're heroic and you would do that. What we fail to realize is that, remember, in the time of the Gospels, in the time of the resurrection, it was the Roman Empire and it was a place of unions and guilds. And to profess your faith in Christ means you did not get work. It means you couldn't provide for your family. It means you couldn't be hired. What man would allow his family to suffer when they told him you can't work because you're a Christian if the resurrection were not true? People die for their beliefs all the time. People don't die for a known lie. Let's look at those 500 people as I begin to close. And let's say you went and took some of those 500 people and that you began to, well, let, let's actually take it out of that place and let's look at just 500 people in some other culture today. And let's say that they were witnessing about something and telling a story and they, it was a hoax and you begin to take them and torture them and hurt them, how many would it take before one of them would break? Take someone that was trying to make a hoax, tell a lie, and you begin to put the pressure on them. Would it take one or two or three or five? Someone's going to break eventually. 
How, how many executions would it take before someone said, it's a hoax, it's a falsehood, it did not happen? The 12 did not recant. The 500 did not recant. The other eyewitnesses did not recant. Why? Because they saw something so beautiful, something so wonderful, that they said, we will give our entire lives and we will take whatever risk and whatever cost it takes. If it costs me my job, I will give it. If it costs me my health, I'll give it. If it costs me my body, I will give it. Why? Because there is something greater than this life. They were living for the resurrected life. Amen. One more reason I believe in the resurrection. Because as a pastor, I have the privilege of hearing your stories. Oh, I have the privilege of being you at your worst moments when you say goodbye to a loved one. And I have the privilege of being there at your wonderful moments as I take your child and I, I dedicate your child to God. And we'll be doing that again here in June and doing a child dedication. What a beautiful moment to hold your baby and say, God, this family offers this baby to you. And we thank you for that. I've had the privilege of being there overseeing your, your vows when you pledged one another, your fidelity and your love for one another. And what a privilege, Richard and Renee, to be there in that moment and watch the love you share for each other. As a pastor, I get to hear that, see that. To watch this couple in their renewal of their vows who at a beat say, we're, gonna, we're going to pledge to love each other again. Beautiful being a pastor in those moments. But as a pastor, I also get to hear the broken parts. Hear about the addictions, hear, hear about the struggles, hear the story that sometimes you're ashamed to tell anybody else, but you'll tell me over a cup of coffee. And I thank you and I trust you with that. And I, and I don't share those stories publicly without your permission. But I've looked into the eyes of people that have been so bound by an addiction and I ask him, how did you overcome it? I tried this, I tried this, I tried that. And how'd you overcome it? I believed in the resurrected Christ. I believed in the power of Jesus Christ and his resurrection applied to my life set me free. If I heard that once, it would be great. But over and over again, all across the country, people after people have told me how Jesus Christ changed their lives. I, I've talked to husbands who live a lifestyle of where they were cheating on their wife over and over and over again. And their marriage was about to fall apart. And the wife was walking out for the last time. And he becomes a believer in Christ. And his life is changed. I believe in the resurrection. Because I've watched mean men and hateful men and prejudiced men and racist men who believed in the resurrection of Christ have now turned and they love people that they used to persecute and hate. I believe in the Easter because I've seen the countless hundreds of changed lives. I believe in Easter because Jesus Christ came into my life and he changed my life. And that's not to say that I'm perfect because if you live with me or are married to me or you work with me on the staff, you know I have my idiosyncrasies. Laura calls them sins, all right? <laughs> but my life has been impacted and changed. I have hope for the future. I have hope in this life. But listen. If Jesus Christ is not risen from the dead, our faith is in vain. When I close with this, can I give you one more verse? You guys didn't amen enough. I almost went for two hours, guys. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. If you're taking notes, write it down. First Corinthians 15 and verse 58. 
He says, if Jesus Christ has not been risen from the dead, your faith is useless. Your life is useless. Wow, you've just believed in vain and it's been a sham and it's been a wasted life. But then he says, Jesus is raised from the dead. And in verse 58, here's what he says to you. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. Troy, you're going to see your resurrected mother again, my friend. You stand steadfast. You stand steadfast, immovable, always abounding in God's work, knowing that your labor is not in vain. So why do you keep praying? Because he's resurrected from the dead. Why do you keep worshiping? Because he's resurrected from the dead. Why do you forgive others and love your enemies? Because he's been resurrected from the dead. Why do you share hope with the person that works for you? Because Easter happened and he has been resurrected from the dead. Why do you forgive your spouse? Because he has been resurrected from the dead. Why do you spurn racism? Because he has been resurrected from the dead. Why will I go anywhere, give anything, say anything? Because you, Jesus, have been resurrected from the dead. Amen. Amen. Stand with me, if you will. Guys, why don't you go ahead and come out. Amen. I hope I gave you something to think about, and in no way in a 30-minute message can I answer all of your questions, but I wanted to just be very quickly there in about 30 minutes. I wanted to give you seven, eight reasons why I believe in Easter, and here's what I say to you. I ask you to investigate it. I ask you to search it out. I ask you to do your studies, and I ask you to say to God, God, if you are real, reveal yourself to me. Show me that you're real. And I'm here to tell you, my friends, I believe if you will pray that from a sincere place, not just a a willy-nilly kind of thing, but Jesus, reveal yourself to me. Listen, I don't think he will stop to reveal himself to you. He'll send a missionary to the Muslim that prays that. He'll bring a dream and a vision to that native in Africa who cries out, has never seen a missionary. Jesus, if you're real, actually, God, if you're real, reveal yourself to me. He'll do whatever it takes if you pray sincerely. Now, if you're just praying it flippantly, oh, God, reveal yourself to me. I hope you don't because I want to keep living the life I'm living. He won't, but if you're sincere and you say, Jesus, I didn't understand everything that Roger said that day and his redneck accent kind of turned me off a little bit. And I don't know if I want to follow a preacher who's a speeder. But something pricked your heart and it gave you a question. Ask him, Jesus, reveal yourself to me. And then I want to say to you guys, some of you guys that are believers, you have doubts about certain things. Oh, I can give you a resource of why God allows suffering, but can I tell you the real answer is, I don't know. When someone comes to me and says, why does God allow suffering? A lot of times the answer is for me just to hug you and put my arm around you. I can give you the theological answers. I can give you some answers that have helped me walk things through, but sometimes just to hug and to say to you, how much you're loved? Do you know how much you're cared for? I'm sorry you're hurting. If you have doubts, can I tell you, don't hide those doubts. Don't bury those doubts. There's times I read the Bible, I'll come across a passage, and I'll say, Father, I don't know what you were up to right there. I have no clue what you were doing. And maybe it's behind, above my pay grade. And maybe you'll reveal it to me as I say the scripture. Maybe you won't. But I, I trust your heart and I follow you. And there's some things I do have to push over the side. I don't know about that. I don't know why he did it that way. But when it comes to the resurrection, I have based my entire life upon it. 
And I will continue to base my life upon it because I believe it at the very core of my being. Jesus, thank you for this gift to be able to speak into these people's lives. And Lord, I pray today that as they leave this Easter and they go back to their lives, that your Holy Spirit would pursue them. That you would show them yourself and who you are to them. I pray, God, would you rescue them and save them out of their lives. And I pray a year from now, when they walk in that door, they can tell me the story of this year, how that the resurrected Jesus changed their lives. With your eyes closed, your heads where they're at, you say, Roger, I just have some doubts in my faith. This week, would you pray for me? Just lift your hand up. Let me see your hand. I thank you for the honesties in the middle. I thank you for the honesty in the back. I see you in the back there, yes. Anyone to the left here, to my left? I see that hand. I see it. What about to my right? Pastor, thank you. I see it, hon. I see it up front. I have doubts. Will you pray for my doubts? I see it. Over here in the front, I see you. I see you. Thank you for that. Let me ask, I see you to the left. I see you. Thank you so much. See you in the back. Thank you. See you in the back. I see you. Thank you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. Amen. You say, Roger, I've moved beyond my doubts. And today, I want to ask Jesus Christ to be my Savior today. Or I want to make my life a recommitment to him. Will you lift your hand up right now? Anyone in the place? I see in the very back. Thank you for that hand. Anyone else? To the right, I see it. Thank you so much. Anyone else in the middle? I see it. Thank you. Pray with me. Say, Jesus, everyone. Jesus, Jesus. I believe that you are God that you died upon the cross and you rose from the dead be my savior save me amen and Lord for my friends that have doubts Lord may you reveal yourself to them in Jesus name amen and amen Guys, thank you for spending Easter with us at Exalt Church. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here. We love you so much. Amen. All right. You guys enjoy that? Absolutely. What an awesome time here at Exalt Church. We're so glad that you joined us. Come back and join us next Sunday morning. Invite your friends. We'd love to meet them. We'd love to know them. At this time, we're about to take up the offering. I'm going to ask the ushers to come to the front. And this morning... If you came prepared to give, you can give right here um, in the sanctuary with the ushers. We also have a kiosk in the back. The Connect cards, if you're a first-time guest, please drop those into the offering. Like I said, we just want to thank you for being with us. We're so glad that you've joined us. Guests, we're so glad to have you here today. All right, ushers, go to the back. We're not going to receive an offering. Go to the back. Guests, we are so glad to have you here today. We want you here. We don't want your money. We want you here. We want this to be our gift to you. Have a cupcake, have a coffee, have a booklet. And we want you to give you this gift. Now, if you want to give something, you can chase down our usher back there, all right? (laughs) But listen, we love you. We want to invest in you. And we're praying for you. Thank you for being here for Easter. And sorry for me interrupting your gig, all right? We love you guys. Thank you so much. Guys, Pastor Tony's going to lead us out in worship. Stay in worship with us through this song. Thank you for joining us. God bless, and have a great week. Pastor Tony. I stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. And I won't be born by feelings. I'll hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just the doorway into resurrection life. And if 
Christ be my 